I have a machine. It looks simple, but it's very powerful. Fine, I'll show you it. This function counts. Give it a number, and it gives you the next. The successor function increments the numbers, starting from nothing, and happily chugs away forever to infinity. And that infinity of numbers is what we call the natural numbers. One, two, three, three hundred. They describe any amount of things that you can count. We look marginally impressed, which to me is not impressed. You know why? Because we haven't begun to use it. This is a function you may be more familiar with, addition. What is addition? Well, it's just repeated succession. To add a number is to increment that number of times, counting a total of two amounts, a sum. An elegant operation, ain't it? It's commutative, doesn't matter how you order it, and associative, doesn't matter how you group it. Keep adding bigger numbers to your heart's delight. Alright, that's enough, stop. What must I add to A to get C? That's easy. Flip the equation by subtracting A from C to get B. They're different. 1000 plus 729 is 1729, minus 729 is 1000. And with that, you can subtract your way back to zero. Back to zero. But why stop there? What if you subtract from zero? And natural numbers won't be enough, will they? And thus we break into the negative numbers. Any number has an additive inverse, that is, zero minus that number. A negative is the inverse of a positive, and a minus is the inverse of a plus. They undo each other. Now everything we've seen forms a whole new number set. The integers. All the pluses and minuses you can do here will stay here. Remember where we started? Let's keep going. Multiplication is also known as repeated addition. A times B means A added to itself B times. The area of a rectangle is the product of its length and width. Or its width and length, because multiplication is also commutative. And associative. And distributive. That one's helpful. It means the product of sum is a sum of products. Uh, now we can get to some big numbers quickly. So let's get back down. What number must I multiply by A to get C? The answer is C divided by A. Division is the inverse of multiplication. If you had a whole bunch of things you wanted to um, divide, how many each gets is the quotient of those numbers. Now you see your operations work in harmony. What? It didn't work? Hmm. If a number isn't divisible by another, then you can't share it evenly. No fair. Unless you're down for some new numbers. Fractions are the quotients of numbers that aren't multiples of each other. You can find them between the integers. They're written simply enough, just keep the division symbol essentially. The ratio between any two integers is either another integer or a fraction, so we call them rational numbers. The reciprocal of a number is its multiplicative inverse. Multiplying by one is dividing by the other, and multiplying by both gets you back to one. You may start to claim that this stops with counting as repeated addition. You'd be absolutely right. So every number has a reciprocal, except one. No, not that one. If you divide by smaller numbers, your result will shoot towards infinity. The hiccup happens at zero. There's no number that you can multiply by zero to get anything other than zero. It's undefined. So across addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, the rational numbers are close, except for zero. I think you know where we're headed next. If you want to repeat multiplication, then you have exponentiation. a to the bth power is a multiplied by itself b times. The area of a square is side length to an exponent of 2, and the volume of a cube is its side to an exponent of 3. Of course, you could just call it squared and cubed. The number of different ways I could choose b options n times is the nth power of the base b. Hey, that's also how you write numbers. With a meager amount of places, you can write bigger numbers than you could ever really need. On the other side of this decimal point, you can make smaller numbers. Those negative powers are just the reciprocals of positive powers. And that's our decimal numeral system. We add exponents with a base of 10, so we call it base 10. Hey, how do you find a power of a fraction? Watch this. Just like before, exponents distribute over multiplication. Oh, nothing's stopping you from putting exponents on exponents. But you gotta be a little more careful. Annoyingly, exponentiation isn't commutative. Switch the base and exponent and you'll get a different product. 
putting the bigger number on top gives you a bigger oomph most of the time. Even more annoyingly is an associative. Where you put parentheses, or where you evaluate first, also changes the result. So, which way do we go? You see, grouping from the bottom can be simplified like this. This works. I don't feel like proving it to you. Do it for yourself. Working from the top doesn't simplify any other way, so if you don't see parentheses, that's what we mean. Anyway, we exponentiate any rational number... Huh? What if your exponent is a fraction? I'm glad you asked. Well, what better way to learn than to just try it? There, I did it. What does it mean? Well, watch this, I squared it. But recall that exponents done subsequently multiply, such as a half times two or one, and any number to the power of one is itself, that means that fraction inverted an exponent. It's also known as the root. The nth root of a number is what we can exponentiate by n to get back to that number. The fifth root of 32 is two, and the second, I mean, the square root of nine is three, the cube root of 3 is... hmm. It seems we have another problem. Not every number is the power of a whole number. Using more precise fractions with larger denominators, we can get closer to these weird roots. At some point you gotta accept that a fraction just won't do. I mean, proving it would also help. Even though there are infinitely many rationals, in fact, infinitely many between each integer, there are but thin trees in the field of numbers, and a number like the square root 2 is not on one of those trees. Some guy named Pythagoras realized this and he got beat up for it or something. These numbers, most numbers actually, can't be expressed as a ratio of integers and so they are irrational. Irrational numbers need infinitely many decimal places to be written exactly, and they do not repeat. The reason why um, can be an exercise for the viewer. All of these numbers can relate to each other with algebra, so we call them algebraic numbers. Except, okay, wait, 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 let me do one more thing first. Roots are the inverse of exponents from the top. But because exponents aren't commutative, things are completely different if we invert from the bottom. What number must exponentiate a to get c? The answer is the logarithm of c in base a. Just like all our other operations, this function has two operands, but incidentally we really like exponents with a base of e for uh, calculus reasons, and this ain't a calculus lesson. So many reasons, in fact, that it's just natural to use Euler's number when working with most math. Thus, e is the base of the natural logarithm. Hey, let's stop and look back at these operations again. Yes, I know I said one more thing. I lied. Here's the number line, and here's a y-axis. Here's the line y equals x. Let's add to it. By multiplying the line, we change its slope. We can also divide by x, and there you can see the hiccup at x equals 0. Moving on, let's put an exponent on x. Again, taking the reciprocal, we get roots. Yes, yes, hours of fun. Now making the exponent x instead gives a different picture for reasons I won't repeat. Reflect the curve over y equals x and you get log of x. It's fun to compare it and the eighth root of x as we change a. Hey, you, you, you don't need to look over there. Oh. Oh no. The problem? Exponents don't play nice with negatives. No number on this line can square to give you any negative number. So what is the square root of negative one? Look at the plot. Once we go past zero, it disappears. It's not infinite, like dividing by zero, it's just not here. Thus, you cannot take an even root of a negative number. But what if we did anyway, said you mathematicians? What if we imagined a new number that's squared to give you negative one? It can't describe a physical amount, but that hasn't stopped math before, eh? This is i, an imaginary number. Add a real to the imaginary part and you get a complex number. Now that we have two dimensions, the real number line lies within the complex plane. <sighs> Man, I just want to count. Alright, let's start from the top. How do you add complex numbers? How do you multiply complex numbers? Just do a little bit of algebra. You can see that multiplication here looks like a rotation, so exponentiation here looks like a spiral. Big bases spiral out, small bases spiral in. If you put a complex number in the exponent, that's a little harder to make sense of. Hey, if exponentials move circularly in the imaginary direction... Now I could prove this, but uh, you get the point. 
If you manipulate this formula here and blah blah blah, how about that? It's also a spiral. This also allows you to find logarithms of complex numbers. Although, because the polar form is periodic, the complex log- Phew. I think it just about covers it. We are a long way from simply repeating operations. Are we done? Ah, but of course you want more. And why not? If you repeat exponentiation, you get a power tower. A tetrated by B is A exponentiated by itself B times. Remember, exponents are right associated, so you value from top to bottom. Power towers grow stupid fast. Change the base a little, and in no time the hyperpowers appear too large to be meaningfully represented on screen. And like exponents, increasing the height of tetration gives you much more oomph, to put it lightly. 2.285 tetrated by 4 is the number of particles in the known universe. 3 tetrated by 4 is a number with over 3.5 trillion digits. This madness makes a little more sense when you remember that our numerical system is based on exponents. It's literally not equipped for the job. Sadly, there isn't nearly as much use for tetration in our mere physical reality right now, or even most pure math. Notable exception being some combinatorics. We keep more information about these numbers by keeping them as written. Perhaps as iterated exponentials. Hey, so long as you can exponentiate complex numbers, you can tetrate complex numbers. And it looks... gorgeous. What if the height isn't a whole number? Hmm. Well, when working with exponents, we use some properties to mold them into the result we needed. Raising a power to another exponent is the same as multiplying those exponents, because multiplying powers is the same as adding exponents, which works because multiplication is commutative. Clearly, the same doesn't work with power towers. Your pattern-seeking mind may propose, ah, what if tetrating a tower exponentiates the heights? which would be a fantastic idea if it wasn't wrong. Bummer. This means you have to be more clever if you want to put a fraction in the height. Clever? I can be clever. How about this? The tip of a power tower isn't really the tip if you imagine it followed by an infinite string of ones. Ticking the order up by one is just turning that one into an A. In between those is an exponent between one and A, so that's a fractional order. What fraction? Uh, hey. One is also the zeroth power of a number, so if we treat the fractional part of the height as that exponent, we get a continuous extension of titration. And look at that. Intermediate orders give us intermediate results. Likewise, the plots look like what we'd expect, particularly for that interesting region between zero and one. You could call these hyperpolynomials, in which case, Hyper-exponentials give the same picture from a different angle. And here you might see an issue. This extension is not perfect for calculus reasons. It's pretty close, right? But we're missing something. What? What does it mean to do fractional exponentiation? This time I don't mean in the exponent, but functionally. Consider an operation that, done twice on a number, results in that number's exponent. Constructing a function like this is surprisingly difficult, but to find iterative roots in general? Far more so. As so happens, solving this, you'd also solve titration. Okay, enough of these details. How do you do it? How do you define fractional exponentials? How do I tetrate all the numbers? We don't know. There is no agreement to what the operation inherently means. Your interpretation is as good as mine. So, until there is, it means... nothing? There's so much more to say, but there's nothing more to tell. We have not defined tetration on all the reals. Definitively, only so much can be said about its properties. Is there a reason you couldn't justify tetrating by a complex number? Could it show some new behavior? Could it take new values? Quotients of integers are not always integers. Roots and logs are not always real. What if some complex numbers don't have super roots or logs? 
What if they pulled us into a new number system? Unlikely? Maybe. But how could you tell? Each time we made a new operation from the last one, we broadened our reach, but altered our structure. With that structure came new numbers. But each time we built upwards, we had a smaller foundation to build outwards. The level above exponents is just not stable enough. I think it's simple, but it seems too much for our tools. But that hasn't stopped math before, eh? Who's to say it can't be done? Not me. We don't have all the answers, but it's more than we had yesterday. You. Go out and make some sense out of nonsense. I'm gonna stay here with the ladder. You know, if we stick to natural numbers, you can keep iterating, titration, pentation, hexation, but that's for another day.